In our 50-year history, we've produced 36 projects and many different programs. But we also had a number of projects that were unrealized, that for various reasons we didn't go ahead. And I believe it's important to mention them, to record them, as they form very much part of our history. They were artists from all over the world, some already quite well known, others just at the beginning of their career. There were various reasons why we didn't manage to go ahead with them. Some, the artists lost interest because, especially in the 70s, it was an effort to come to Australia. Then, on our side, there were difficulties. Some of the projects were impossible to realize, others too expensive. In those days, we had very little outside support. We had no government or foundations who supported us. And till 2003, I had also a business to run, so I couldn't really devote my time fully to the projects. But they still form an important part of our history. In the 70s, there were four really very interesting projects that we didn't go ahead with. The first one was Klaus Oldenburg, a Scandinavian-born American pop artist. He came up with the generation of Andy Worrell, of Liechtenstein, and he was famous for soft sculptures from small to quite big everyday objects which he sculpted in fabric and soft materials. I was introduced to him by Iliana Zonabend, the gallery dealer, and I actually purchased a little work of his called Hot and Cold Soft Taps. And I had it for a long time. We met at the 1970 Osaka World Trade Fair and got on well, and I invited him to come to Australia to do a project. He was interested. He sent me some notes, his itinerary, and a little drawing. But it was going to be a permanent sculpture somewhere either in the Opera House or in the forecourt of the Opera House. And once we started going, there was too much red tape associated with it. And it was just after our crystal project. It was probably our fault that it didn't happen. The second one also in the 70s was an American earth artist called Walter de Maria. It was easy to meet him because he lived just across the street from Cristo. And it was the time when earth art became quite a movement in the United States. It was a reaction against the commerciality of pop art, and a number of artists moved out to the desert in New Mexico or Arizona and created huge one kilometer long works, either excavating or creating mounds. And they were very spectacular, difficult to access, but definitely an important art movement. And I approached Walter de Maria about coming to Australia and doing something in the land near Sydney. We had some initial correspondence, but we didn't go ahead. Walter de Maria's most famous work happened later, in 1977, called The Lighting Fields, where there were a huge number of rods erected in the desert in an area where lighting was very frequent, and it was very spectacular and gained worldwide attention. He also created later for the Dear Art Foundation an Earth Room, which is in New York, which was a room, a 
gallery space filled with earth, and it's still on view now. Our third unrealized project was in 1973 with German artist Joseph Beuys. I had an introduction to Beuys through Harold Zeman. At that time, Joseph Beuys was a professor at the Düsseldorf Academy, a very famous professor. He not only was a groundbreaking artist, but an outstanding teacher, a most charismatic, engaging, larger-than-life personality. He was a sculptor, a painter, but very involved in social, political movement. And his biggest contribution were works involving social reactions and really as an outstanding teacher. I had the privilege of meeting him and spending most of a day with him at the Düsseldorf Academy. He was mesmerizing. He talked about the social revolution he wanted to achieve through art, how society had to change. He was really half a century ahead of his time, and he influenced many people. Of course, I asked him to come to Australia, and he was very interested. When I was leaving, he wanted to give me a lot of his works that I could carry with me. And stupidly, really stupidly, I said, look, I got so much luggage, I, I really can't take it. At that time, he had an English partner, an art critic, who has been to Australia, and from what I gather, wasn't treated with the due respect that an English art critic deserves and she really discouraged boys from coming to Australia. So the project didn't take, uh, didn't take place, which is one that I really regret, as has gone down in history as one of the most important artists of the second half of the 20th century. The next project that got away in 1975 was Mario Mertz, an Italian artist who was part of a movement called Art Povera. The term was coined by a very famous Italian and international art critic, Germano Cialat, who unfortunately died last year during the COVID epidemic. There were a group of Italian artists who were in that movement who had something different to say, a very fresh voice. They were using different materials, different concepts. Again, a reaction to what was going on in America, reaction to what was going on in Germany. I used to travel a lot in those days, and I had the privilege to meet Mario in Milan, and then on another trip in Como was a very good artist, but he was also a great character. He loved to go out for very noisy dinners with a lot of wine, and he was famous for ending up dancing on the table. I entertained him a couple of times, but I was too tired to wait till he got onto the table to dance. He used a mathematical series called the Fibonacci series, which occurs in nature and very quickly multiplies. And he used it for various types of sculptures. After my second visit, I read in an English paper that he proposed an enormous marble sculpture in the center of Australia, which at that time would have had cost several hundred thousand dollars. So I decided, while well, he's a very great artist, and it was a pleasure to meet him, uh, it was too difficult to work to realize a project. It would have been great. I still have the drawings, so you never know. If somebody's interested, we could still realize it posthumously.
I met James Turrell in the 1980s. I think it was the late 80s. I met him in New York, and he was a very imposing man to meet. Tall, bearded, he came from a family of Quakers. He used light to make sculpture, both the natural light and artificial light. With artificial light, he created illusions that were quite deceptive, and you had to be careful where you were walking, as what seemed real was just an illusion. He started to make what was known as sky spaces. He took a round room and in the ceiling made a circular hall. Benches around the room. And you looked up through the hall, the sky, and it was just a different dimension. You saw the clouds passing by, the occasional aeroplane. The most interesting part was dawn and dusk when the color suddenly changed. The first one I have seen was in the 80s at PS1 in New York, which at that time was independent before it became part of MoMA. I wanted to do such a sky scene in Sydney, and I had in mind a building in the rocks. And we were seriously discussing it, and James wanted to come to Australia as part of the bargain would have been that he loves gliding. And he heard that gliding in Australia was very exciting and you could go great distances. So we had the building, we had the permission from the city, and the artist was interested. And then suddenly, unfortunately, James got a very large commission in Ireland, which kept him busy for years. So the project didn't go ahead. It would have been a permanent installation, one of the few in our history. But since then, Australia has two sky rooms, one in Canberra at the National Gallery and one in Hobart at Mona. So in the end, we didn't miss out. I could talk for a long time about Rauschenberg. He and Jasper Jones were the founders of pop art, an enormous change in the history of contemporary art. He was one of the first artists I collected from the middle 60s through Iliana Zonabin Gallery, in, first in Paris and then later when she moved to New York. There was something very powerful, very poetic, very new about Rauschenberg's work. And I followed his career and collected his works till he died. So in the end 80s, early 90s, I decided wouldn't it be great to do a project or an exhibition with Rauschenberg. And I met him several times. I didn't get to know him well, but I saw him on lots of occasions. And I started to discuss it with him, his manager, his studio. And at that time, the city was going to make available for me a permanent space in the rocks, which would have been a departure from our temporary projects. But it was very tempting and Rauschenberg was going to be the first exhibition. We had lots of correspondence, and we got as far as an itinerary for Rauschenberg to come out. But in the early 90s, there was a recession, and to run a permanent space is quite different to having temporary projects. While the space was going to be provided for us free, I still would have had to pay for power, security, everything else to do with a permanent space. And I just personally didn't have the funds. And very, very stupidly, I didn't think, well, let's just do one exhibition. Not to have done a Rauschenberg exhibition is one of my great regrets. But you never know. 
One day I still hope to do one. Our next two unrealized projects have both to do with video artists, as that time video art became very interesting. The first one was Gary Hill in 96. At that time, I was chair of the Museum of Contemporary Art, and it would have been logical to do something in the museum. So I invited Gary to come for a site visit and he came and he proposed an exhibition for almost the whole area of the MCA. He made quite elaborate plans. What I liked about Gary's video works is that they were very sculptural. They not only projected an image, most of which was abstract, but they also arranged very sculptural forms some small monitors, some large monitors, arranged in pyramids and all sorts of different forms. So you had both the visual and the sculptural element to it. It would have been a great exhibition, but in those days, the equipment, the very specialized equipment that Gary wanted was hard to get, all of it imported. It was just too expensive from our point of view to realize. And while Gary did all the initial work, in the end, we had to say, sorry, we just can't afford to do it. The other one was another video artist. Again, I would say a sculptural video artist, American Paul Pfeiffer who was very interested in sport, and he used sport as his subjects for the videos. He used very small videos that were on very long poles that had different configurations. So they used not only the image, but they also used space as part of the work. He made some wonderful works based on American basketball. And he was interested in rugby. So I invited him to come to Sydney and Melbourne. It was the time of the Rugby World Cup. He wanted to see it firsthand. It was an expensive trip because I had to get scalper tickets for Australia, New Zealand. It was a very exciting game as Australia beat New Zealand just. I also took him to Melbourne, where we recruited a Melbourne rugby league team to have a mock game, which he filmed for possible materials. It was interesting to look at rugby through an artist's vision, but nothing eventuated whether in the end he didn't like the material or something else cropped up. I wasn't that insistent as we had other projects on the go. In the end, we did have a wonderful project with Bill Viola using video. So I'm quite happy how it worked out. Project nine was Latin American artist Damien Ortega. I was always looking from where new art trends are coming from, which group of artists are doing something interesting. And I felt that art from Latin America, from Mexico, is different and is saying something new. I was introduced through a very good Mexican gallery to Damien Ortega, mainly a sculptor. I liked his work, and he was an up-and-coming artist. I invited him for a site visit to come to Sydney. He spent quite some time in Sydney looking at different sites and coming up with different propositions. In the end, he came up 
with a very interesting sculptural idea based on Utzon's concept of taking a sphere and dividing it. So he conceived a number of large, almost human-sized brick spheres that were cut into segments and they were to be displayed on the forecourt in front of the opera house. They looked very good. It would have been a permanent installation. I really can't remember now why we didn't go ahead with it. We have the drawings. It's something that still could be realized. It would look beautiful in the forecourt of the opera house. Something to think about for the future. Our tense unrealized project was British artist Anya Galaccio. Anya was a very good friend of Michael Landy, and Michael suggested that we should try and do a project with her, and he introduced us to her. She came for a site visit, and we took her everywhere in Sydney. I liked her art at that time, as she used a lot of organic materials in her sculpture. And as the material deteriorated, the sculpture either disappeared or had very different shapes. And that I found a very timely, interesting way to express what's going on. But she was very hard to please. We showed her so many different sides and she didn't like any of them. So she went back to England and she asked for books to be sent. Sophie Forbet sent her lots of books on rainfall, on water usage in Australia, and lots to do with nature. But then she moved from England to a teaching position in the US, and the project just faded away would have been interesting and different. Project 11, one of our favorite artists, Francis Ellis, whose Naomi and I have collected him for many years. Francis was a Belgian-born and trained architect who moved to Mexico many years ago and started to practice as an artist. Francis works in all materials, painting, sculpture, video, performance. And he's known for all of those. He has shown in all major museums, was included in Documenta and the Venice Biennale. He's a very interesting man. His performances are very social. He uses people as his subjects and himself. He has one sculpture, for example, where he pushes a big block of ice in the streets of Mexico for hours till it melts. He had one project where he employed 500 people with shovels to move the sand of a hill one meter further along. He also has been using children to make a point he got a group of migrant children in Africa to form a line from land into the water to show the plight of the migrants. He was a war artist in Afghanistan with the British troops and made beautiful works based on that. So an artist both Naomi and I admired and I asked him several times would he come to Australia for a project? And he said, yes, I'm interested, but I'm too busy at the moment, but yes, I'm interested. So I kept at him. And our last meeting in New York, I said, you know, I'm interested in Aboriginal children games. Please keep sending me some books on that. So I sent him several books and stories that I could gather on Aboriginal games. But in the end, he said, John, I'm really sorry, but I just can't think of a project to do in Australia. 
one that got away. Our 12th unrealized project was American painter Josh Smith in 2013. Josh Smith, a young artist, belongs to what was called the New York School of Painters, mainly abstract, but he kept painting his name over and over again. I found his work very interesting and started to collect it. When I start to collect an artist, I usually in the end try and meet him or her. So the gallery arranged that I meet Josh in his studio and I discussed with him the possibility of an exhibition rather than a project because he was really a painter. At that time, there were many empty shops along Oxford Street. And I thought, rather than in a gallery, it would be interesting to exhibit his work in the shop window of several shops. And the city of Sydney was quite interested in the idea, as they were the landlords of many of those shops. While it was a good idea, it became very difficult to realize because we couldn't know a year ahead which shops were going to be vacant and which occupied. In the end, both he and I lost the enthusiasm and the project didn't go ahead. Our 13th unrealized project was Adrian Villarojas in 2016. Adrian is an Argentinian artist who rose very quickly to prominence. He is principally a sculptor, a wonderful, exciting young artist who first came to prominence at the Venice Biennale, then had monumental work at the Documenta in Carcel, which both Naomi and I saw. He had an excellent exhibition at the New Serpentine Galleries in London, where I met him, and I invited him to come to Sydney for a project, and he came in 2016. As usual, we showed him several sites, and at that time, the cutaway in Barangaroo just opened. It's an enormous space, and on one end is a rock wall. It's a very tall, large rock wall. And he loved the space. And he wanted to do a big installation there. He uses lots of living materials in his work. And he wanted to use Australian plants to grow and embed wherever possible among the rocks. Both on our side and his side, we started planning we involved the Barangaroo authorities. They gave us all the architectural measurements, all the load bearing, and it was very exciting. After about a month, the Barangaroo people told us, well, you can't really go ahead because there's going to be a metro station built underground and the place will be out of function. That's the second or third project that the Barangaroo authorities after being enthusiastic in the beginning, found some reason why we couldn't go ahead. Great pity, it would have been a wonderful project and hopefully Adrian will still have a presence in Australia. Our 14 unrealized project in 2014 is Vietnamese Danish artist Jan Bo. Young, energetic, exciting artist who does sculpture, paintings, although young, very quick to gain international recognition and success. I started to collect his work and met him, I believe, first time in New York. I invited him for a project and he came to Sydney in 2014. As usual, we showed him all the possible sites, and he loved P23, and he prepared plans for a project there. We were ready to go, and then he was chosen to 
to represent Denmark at the 2015 Venice Biennale. And of course, he had to give priority. And he had an excellent exhibition there. But both of us were interested in doing a project. So he came back in 2016 to look at sites. At that time, Pier 23 was under reconstruction and that beautiful space was being cut up into different parts, which is such a pity. So Pier 23 was no longer available and he couldn't really see anything that he liked. In the end, he said to me, John, choose something that you think will be okay and I'll do a project there. He was going to come back again. And he got as far as Singapore. And he still had an Australian visa, but apparently it just expired or was going to expire while he was in Sydney. And so they wouldn't let him board the plane in Singapore for Australia. So he really did his best three times to try to come to Australia. We were going to suggest to him the closing store as an alternative to Pier 2 and 3. What's that saying? Three times and you're out? And that's how Yambo felt. He said, I tried three times. That just must be something that won't let us do that project. But we stay in touch and we remain good friends. These 14 unrealized projects, all very different artists, very different times. Some, of course, in hindsight, I regret much more than others that we didn't go ahead. Some in hindsight, we could have done, should have done. But even though these are unrealized projects, from each artist, from each project, I have learned and benefited. And I thank the artist for the efforts they made.